Here's video three of 2402 lecture over the urinary system. And uh, this section in the PowerPoints is covering filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Those are the three processes that produce urine. This video will, con will concentrate simply on filtration. So glomerular filtration, sometimes you'll just hear called filtration, is filtration from the glomerulus of of your blood plasma and the solutes that are found inside of it. It is passive in as much as you don't have to spend ATP on it, but you are going to, you know, drive it through some force and that force is your blood pressure. So hydrostatic or blood pressure drives this. Normal uh, capillary beds have, you know, somewhere in the range of 26 down to as low as maybe 15 or so. Uh, millimeters of mercury pressure uh, that that you know of the blood that's in there but in the glomerulus it's like twice as much so there's a lot more pressure in these capillaries and therefore if you remember in a normal capillary bed you'd have some fluid leak out and leak back in in this case you're just leaking it out okay all you're doing is pushing out a lot of liquid you will leak about 180 liters of this stuff per day if you combine all of the other capillary beds in your body you and add them all up, you get about two to four liters per day for everybody else. So the ones in your stomach, the ones in your muscles, everywhere. 180 liters in your kidneys. So you're only producing about 1.5 liters of urine a day. So out of these 180 liters, you know, only 1% of it, less than 1% of it is actually released as urine. The rest is returned to your blood. You've only got five liters of blood. So, if you're peeing out 180 liters a day, you're not going to stop peeing and you're not going to live very long. So, it's a good thing that you're able to reabsorb it. Uh, every 22 minutes, you'd basically lose your, your entire blood volume if you didn't recapture it. Uh, here's the stuff that filters out. So, this leaks. This is the stuff that leaks into this capsular space. Comes in through the afferent arterial. There's some pressure differences here. Net pressure outward. And that stuff's going to go down this tube. And that are these are really small molecules. Here's the list. You got to know them. Uh, they're less than three nanometers in diameter. And that, there's some exceptions. Um, a nanometer is one thousandth of a micrometer, which is one thousandth of a millimeter, which is one thousandth of a meter. So these this is like the this is these are the units that you measure light waves in. Very small. Let's talk about glomerular filtration filtration rate, easy for me to say, or GFR. This is about how much per minute, this is 180 liters per day. That boils down to about 120, 125 milliliters per minute. Uh, and this is determined by what they call the net filtration pressure. The, you don't have to know this formula. I'm not going to make you remember it or do it, but this is how you calculate it. And what basically it means is that there's a certain blood pressure inside of these capillaries, and that's about 55 millimeters of mercury. There's a certain amount of pressure outside of the capillaries that resist, that push back in, right? Not a vacuum out here. And there's also a certain amount of pressure that is drawing liquid back in due to what's called the uh, colloid osmotic pressure. Don't worry about that word or those words. But basically, this stuff, after everything's squeezed out, this is like full of proteins and a lot of solid objects which tend to draw water. So you're going to draw liquid back in. But still, 55, mils, 55 millimeters push out, uh, 45 push back in, that means that there's a net filtration pressure, NFP, of about 10 millimeters of mercury outward. So you're just losing liquid in here. But that's what you want to do because you're going to, you're going to reabsorb and secrete and fix it and then produce whatever you don't, you're going to release as urine, the stuff you don't want. Still on glomerular filtration. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what controls it. Now there are two basic types of control. There's what are called intrinsic, or that means from within the kidney itself. And if I go quickly to the next page, uh, extrinsic. Let's go back to this one. Intrinsic controls. There are two, which we will talk about here. Myo, the myogenic mechanism, which myogenic means started by your muscles. And this is uh, simply if blood pressure increases 
into the kidney, the afferent arterioles, which are the vessels that lead into the glomerulus, constrict. So let's go back to this image. Let's try to anyway. Here we go. Here we go. We're going to do it. It's going to happen. All right. So blood pressure going in, right? If that blood pressure rises for whatever reason, the muscle of this blood vessel constricts. If it constricts, less blood gets in here. If less blood gets in here, less fluid leaks out. So by constricting simply those little blood vessels, you're going to resist producing as much urine. Uh, and well, actually, what you resist is is producing way too much urine and potentially damaging the uh, glomerulus. Another mechanism was what's called tubulo, again, big word, tubuloglomerular feedback. Tubuloglomerular feedback is using that juxtaglomerular complex. Well, yes, I know it's a lot of words. Tubuloglomerular tube and glomerulus. Well, the tube is that ascending limb. The glomerulus is the glomerulus. That whole process occurs at this complex called the juxtaglomerular process uh, complex, which you saw in a previous image. And this complex responds to salt concentrations, and for that matter, uh, glomerular filtration rate. Oh, wait, by the way, NaCl, anytime you see a bracket like this, that means concentration in chemistry, so I'm just shorthanding it. Salt concentration. Uh, if GFR and salt concentration are high, ATP is released. So if that juxtaglomerular apparatus detects, I'm going to go back or try to go back. This is not a very responsive laptop. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Here we go. I'm telling you. Any second now. So if the salt concentration is high, this thing, the, these cells right here actually, are going to release ATP. When you release ATP, it's going to cause vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial. So again, high salt uh, causes vasoconstriction, which causes decreased glomerular filtration rate. So you're going to actually um, cut down on how much fluid you lose if you've got salty blood. Does that make sense? You want, if your blood has too many salts in it, that probably means you don't have enough Plasma probably means you're dehydrated. So you want to cut down on that loss of fluid and hopefully get some water on board, right? Vice versa, if it's the other way, if, the, if your blood is too watery, if the salt concentration is too low, you're going to want to dump some water. So you're going to vasodilate and lose more urine. Now we have two extrinsic controls or ones that are uh, begun from outside of the kidney. Uh, first one's pretty simple, sympathetic nervous system control. Uh, it's called the baroreceptor reflex. So a baroreceptor is one that detects pressure, detects blood pressure. So let's just say, for instance, if you have low systemic blood pressure, my blood pressure is low. Well, what do I want to do? I want to get that blood pressure back up, right? That's my point here. I want to stabilize my blood pressure. So if my blood pressure is low, I'm going to, the baroreceptors pick that up and they're going to release, uh, cause the kidneys, sorry, cause the adrenal glands to release norepinephrine and epinephrine, which as you know, are hormones of the sympathetic nervous system, which cause among other things, vasoconstriction. It's gonna cause vasoconstriction system-wide, but it's also gonna cause vasoconstriction to this afferent arteriole if the afferent arterial constricts, less filtrate is produced, less urine is produced, and you lose less of your plasma. So you kind of maintain your blood pressure at that point. This, these are counter. These are all negative feedback mechanisms. And lastly, for this video or for this screencast, is the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Now you've heard about this before. I think we talked about it in the endocrine system. Let's start with this condition: low blood pressure. All right. Well, low blood pressure causes that juxtaglomerular con uh, complex to release renin. Now, this is a new job for it, right? So it's going to release renin before it released ATP. In this case, it's going to release renin. Renin acts as a, uh, uh, 
but not really an enzyme, it, but it, can, it basically converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So we've got an inactive um, plasma protein right here, angiotensin 1. Renin is going to convert it to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is active. Oops. I didn't mess anything up. All right. So angiotensin 2 here is going to cause uh, systemic vasoconstriction. So angio means blood vessel, tensin means, well, tense, right? So angiotensin 2 is going to cause vasoconstriction, raising blood pressure. Remember, we started with low blood pressure. So, so far we've raised our blood pressure. Good. We don't pass out. Angiotensin 2 has a side effect of stimulating aldosterone release. And we remember aldosterone from back in the day, right? Aldosterone causes sodium and water reabsorption. We'll talk about reabsorption next. But if I'm reabsorbing water, or sodium and water from that filtrate, where does it go? If it's in the tube and I reabsorb it, it goes back into my blood. So low blood pressure means maybe I don't have enough blood or enough flu uh, blood volume. I'm gonna vasoconstrict, which raises blood pressure, and I'm gonna keep my sodium and water, which raises blood pressure. If the opposite was true, if my blood pressure was high, well, just kind of reverse everything. This guy doesn't release renin. High blood pressure, you don't release renin. If there's no renin, you don't get angiotensin 2. There's no angiotensin 2, you don't get vasoconstriction. If you don't get vasoconstriction, you, your blood pressure doesn't go up because it was already high. If you don't have angiotensin 2, you're not going to release aldosterone. So it kind of works both ways. Low blood pressure will activate this renin angiotensin mechanism, high blood pressure won't activate their angio the renin angiotensin mechanism.